it is more of like going to be a revision and a discussion. So what I'm going to do today, right, is instead of um, flashing the question here, I want to flash just the solution. Maybe you can just look at the question, but in case you need the solution, it is also in the PDF that I've shared with you. So <clears throat> question number one, AGC 2007, in their promo, they asked this question and I've shared with you, right, I actually super like a question that is like question number one. It is given that y is equal to x squared plus x minus one divided by x plus two. I want to find algebraically, I want to find algebraically the set of values that y can take. Last year, you have faced some questions which will give you a phrase that is like this. Find a set of values that y can take. I'm not saying specifically this particular phrase. I'm talking about phrases, right? There are not common usage in terms of uh, the day-to-day -day conversation that you have with other people because, because a lot of times, right, in your in your math, especially when we start statistics or we do like APGP, when we do differential equation, when we do differentiation, they use a lot of common English. So you are interpreting it according to you know like like the daily English that you converse with people, you know, uh, common sense in terms of facts that are given to you through the question. But in H2 math, right, there are certain phrases and we are going to see quite a fair bit of them this year. And we are going to consolidate them. By the middle of this year, we want to memorize phrases that are like this. Find a set of values that Y can take because they are not conversational English. They are specific to H2 math. And you, can, you will realize, right, by identifying phrases that are like this, it actually gives us an H. Because there will be people who will interpret instead of memorize. Then in the exam, right, the moment when they cannot interpret a phrase that is like this, they will start to lose marks. With this year, we are going to talk a lot about how to get marks, how to get marks, how to get marks, okay? So we want to find algebraically the set of values that Y can take. And can I assume that you sort of remember a question that is like this. Uh, Jovi, do you remember a question that is like this? Or, or, or do you remember this particular kind of question? Jovi, can you remember? Okay. Um, Jovi say yes. Uh, so, so for this question, right, wait, um, what exactly is the question asking for? You know, what is the set of values that Y can take? Cambridge, I told you before, Cambridge has tested this about four, uh, sorry, about uh, four times in the last uh, seven, eight years. So it is a very, very popular question. You need to sort of like understand, to understand this question again. Let's take a quick look at the graph of, the, of y is equal to this x squared plus x minus one divided by x plus two. You know, this is graph of a rational expression. It is also a graph that I will put in effort to memorize, part memorize, part analyze. I know that there's going to be a vertical asymptote a vertical asymptote x is equal to minus 2 and by doing a long division, we will get an oblique asymptote. Even before I do a long division, I know that we are going to be expecting a long, uh, that we are going to be expecting an oblique asymptote because it is x squared x. So when I do a long division, I should be able to get an, a, a, an oblique asymptote y is equal to something that is like mx plus c. You know, I will be able to get this. There are two ways that from experience, we are not going to try to press this into our calculator. We are just going to try to imagine this. So I know that there are two ways that the graph can appear with the two asymptotes that is, that is from this graph. One is this, one is going to be this, right? One is going to be this. The other one is the one that we are looking at now is possibly going to be this. It is more likely going to be this instead of this. Because if the graph turns out to be this, there was actually once, I cannot remember which school, there was once, right? Oh, uh, I think, Nigel, it was your school. It's, it's either your school, right, or ACJC. You know, there was once when they have set a question where it turns out to be this. Okay, if it turns out to be this, what is the set of values that Y can take? Y will take all real numbers. Because they are just asking for the graph, right? What are, what are all the possible y coordinates, what are all the possible y coordinates that can be produced by the graph, points that are on the graph. So if it is this case, it is all real numbers. You can get what I mean by if it is this case, it's all real numbers, right? So if it is this case, then we will be, we will, we will be expecting two separate range of values for y. 
One is going to be y must be bigger or equal to this. The other one is going to be y must be less than or equal to this. And I discussed with you before that for this particular question, if our interest is just in, the, uh, in getting the answer itself, then there are going to be three possible methods. The first one is definitely to draw the graph onto our GC. Then from the GC, I try to find what is the coordinates of the maximum point, coordinates of the minimum point. Extracting the y coordinate will give me y to be less than or equal to this value. y is bigger or equal to this y coordinate of the minimum point. Then this will give me the answer. This is the first method. The second method is you will use dy dx. Find the expression for dy dx. Let dy dx be equal to zero. Find the values of x and with the two values of x, you will sub it back into here. You will find the corresponding y coordinates and that will give you the set of values that y can take. And the debate is whether dy dx, whether using differentiation to solve for the set of values that y can take is acceptable for this particular question. And to me, sadly, some schools or maybe some tutors actually give some marks. Not probably not all the marks, but they will give some marks when students use dy dx. But for us, we need to be a bit more demanding. We need to know exactly what we are learning because once we catch that, and you can see in the last few years for Cambridge exams, they are, I mean, they have improved a lot, okay? From my time to yours, right? Your questions are actually simpler as compared to my, okay, actually not exactly simpler, okay? But your question has a very, has a way better focus as compared to mine. Mine was really more of like testing on math. You know, like it's true, like my, my math at A level, right, is really testing math. But the math at your level, I mean, for you guys, right, I realized that they are, okay, they are still testing math, but they are using math to develop other skills, you know, in terms of thinking process for you, but not for during my time. So we want to catch what exactly are they trying to test us. And if we can learn that, then we will be actually way, way better in terms of not just generating the solution, but being flexible enough right, to score when the question change and change and change. So why is differentiation not a good strategy? You know, we were, we were discussing it before. Why? I mean, it is not about debating whether differentiation is considered to be an algebraic method or differentiation is just considered to be a calculus and non-algebraic because there are definitely some questions out there where they mention algebraic method, but the solution seems to adopt differentiation. So why is differentiation not a good enough solution to this? Differentiation is not a good enough solution to this, or maybe I should just ask you, okay, you can probably remember also. Um, I'm not going to ask you, Brian, because uh, the last time I remember I asked you, right, Brian, and then you, you were the only one who told me why differentiation was not, so I, was not a good method. So I'm assuming that, Brian, you can still get it. Uh, can I ask you, Cassidy, why do you think differentiation is not a good method? It can give you the answer, but it is not a good enough solution. Do you remember, Cassidy? <laughs> Cassidy says that he is not sure. Uh, Nigel, do you remember why differentiation is not a good method? Brian, you can remember, right? I, I'm not asking you for the answers, okay? But Brian, you can remember, right? Because I remember very clearly for all the J1, you were the only one who told me why it was not. Okay, Nigel cannot remember. Brian, you can remember? Okay. <laughs> then Jovi, do you remember? Like why differentiation is not. But I mean, <clears throat> can I just assume that you guys can tell that differentiation is possible? So why is differentiation not a good solution? It's because, the reason, it's because of the reason why you want to choose differentiation in the first place. Why do you want to choose differentiation? Is it because you look at this, just this, and you feel that differentiation is going to be a good choice? No. The reason why you will want to choose differentiation was because you saw a maximum and minimum point on the graph, on the graph. That's the thing that this question doesn't want. This question doesn't want us to refer to the graph, which means that without the graph, probably none of us will choose differentiation. <clears throat> that is why the best possible method, the algebraic 
The word algebraic here is very, very uh, specific. If you don't see the graph, how do you think you can find a set of values that Y can take? And you look at AJC, they gave this as their solution. And if you were to ask me, right, I personally find that this is not even a good enough solution. Because this solution doesn't explain. This solution gives the answer. It is the algebraic method that the question is asking for because it is independent of the graph. But this solution doesn't explain to somebody reading it why you want to do something that is like this. That is why if any of you, okay, I, I'm not sure, but I have discovered before okay, that some students, they will stick to this solution and they continue to get the correct answer. So they just continue to use it. And for these students, there are also two kinds. One who use, but because they know exactly how, why they are using this. And then another kind who use, but they don't really know why. They just know every time when they do this, they will get the answer. And you know this group of students who doesn't really know but can get the answer, they will probably fail one question, one of the major questions in the year 2015 when Cambridge twist this question and tested it from another perspective. Same solution but tested from another perspective. That is why, and I was telling you, this is the focus that Cambridge exams are going towards. You know, they don't want students to just get, who just are able to score for their exams just because you practice and practice and practice. They have said it three years ago. They don't want these kind of students anymore. You know, if we grow to become these kind of students who just practice and practice and practice, and then, then we will be able to get it. You know, the moment when things change, you cannot get it. How are we going to grow up to become leaders who can prepare our nation for a year that is like 2020? You know, when nobody knows what, what exactly is happening, there's no history that can trace for you know, how, what, what policy to make and blah, blah, blah. You know, and they will start to need people who truly, truly understand you know, and can be flexible enough. So for this, right, I will suggest if you have never actually understood this in 2020, or if you have used this as a solution, but you don't really know what is going on, but you, know, you just know that you can get the answer, I will suggest you try to understand it together with me that one of the best ways that I can think of is to try to, I, if I were to imagine this, okay, by right, we are not supposed to use the graph, but we will try to create for ourselves a horizontal line. Um, hang on, uh, this one is, uh, I will try to create for myself a horizontal line y is equal to k, for example. And I'm going to try to position this horizontal line such that this horizontal line will cut the graph. Because as long as the horizontal line cut the graph, then it will produce a corresponding y coordinate. Which means that in order for me to achieve you know, what the question is asking for, to find a set of values that y can take, what are all the possible y coordinates of this graph, I'm going to solve this as a pair of simultaneous equation by making sure that this horizontal line will cut the graph, I'm going to try to solve for the set of values for k. Because if I can solve for the set of values for k, where this line cut the graph, then I will know what exactly are the y coordinates that will get me the set of values that y can take. You understand what I'm trying to say, right? In h math, please don't focus on the algebra anymore. Algebra is taken by default that you have no problem because your secondary school has equipped you well and all of you have already passed your O-level well enough to get into the JC. So they are just assuming that you have no problem with your algebra. Don't go and relearn your algebra again. Maintain the strength that you have in your algebra and become stronger in your algebra, but learn how to apply those algebra. So I'm going to let this be equal to this. Instead of using this as a solution, the so my solution will look very, very similar to this. So, but if I were to let this be equal to this, I ascribe meaning to my algebra. If I were to let equation number one be equal to equation number two, then we will have uh, x squared plus x minus one divided by x plus two. This is going to be equal to k. Cross multiplying, I will have this minus one. This is equal to kx plus two k. Moving everything over to the left-hand side, we will have this. 1 minus kx minus 2k minus 1. This is equal to 0. And I know that I want this line to cut the graph. If, I, if this horizontal line is going to cut the graph, that means when I solve them as a simultaneous equation, I want solution. And I'm getting a quadratic equation. For a quadratic equation to have solution, I'm going to be letting the discriminant be bigger or equal to 0. Once in a while, I will hear students 
questioning whether there should be equal to or not. You know, what I want is for this horizontal line to cut the graph, regardless of whether it is cutting at two points or cutting at one point, if this horizontal line happened to be at the minimum point or the horizontal line happened to be at the maximum point, it's going to be cutting at one point, it is still considered as cutting the graph, it is still considered as a Y coordinate that is going to be produced by this graph. That is why I'm going to let the discriminant be bigger or equal to zero. And by letting the discriminant be bigger or equal to zero, trying to focus on discussing about the nature of roots of this quadratic equation, b squared minus 4ac, then I will be able to get a relationship for k. And if I were to solve this, I mean, I'm going to just jump. If I were to solve this, I will be getting k to be less than or equal to minus 5, or k to be bigger or equal to minus 1. And because k is also equal to y, and my entire process is trying to find when exactly this horizontal line will cut the graph. That is why, you know, what is the set of values that y can take? If you were to look at the solution, <clears throat> that is what it is saying also. y is supposed to be less than or equal to minus 5, or y, or y is supposed to be bigger or equal to minus 1. Wait, wait. Okay, wait, wait. As Cassidy, I, I know you have understood already, but Cassidy, uh, which part were you confused just now? I'm curious because I actually meant it to be a discussion, okay? But uh, if you don't mind, you can just speak through the mic so it can feel a bit more like a discussion. But you can also type in there. Um, <clears throat> so Cassidy was saying that just now, okay, I don't know, I don't know when I was too carried away by talking about this. So uh, around when, uh, Cassidy, were you a bit confused, or or anyone, right? Because I don't need to finish the paper, okay? I don't need to finish this paper. So I would rather pause a bit to discuss with you guys and the rest of us, we can also hear you know, some of the things because we, we talk about the same thing. Since last year, you know, we have revised the same thing. Y plus K, Y is equal to K. Oh, this Y is equal to K part. So Cassidy, you were asking, why is it that we want to introduce this Y is equal to K, is it? Ah, uh, okay. So you understand now that introducing this is trying to introduce another graph that's going to intersect this, right? You, you understand this now, right? Then for the rest of you, can you understand why I introduced this line, y is equal to k? Okay, I, I'm not introducing any other graph, but a horizontal line. We are specifically introducing a horizontal line because the equation of a horizontal line gives us only y coordinate. It helps us to ignore the x coordinate. If it is slanted, then I have to take into account of x coordinate. That is why we purposely choose a horizontal line. There was a school that has asked uh, NYJC. NYJC has asked something that is like this before, but instead of finding the set of values that y can take, NYJC asked for the set of values that x can take. If they ask for the set of values that x can take, then you use a vertical line. Okay, so, so Cassidy, this was the question that I was posing just now. Cassidy is asking, um, Cassidy asked, right, why can't we just use the max, the coordinates of the maximum and minimum point? Okay, Cassidy was asking, why can't we use the coordinates of the maximum and minimum point? Um, I'm going to ask one of you to help me to explain to Cassidy. <laughs> and, uh, okay, Brian, since I didn't ask you just now, right, why not you type into the chat or you can just talk, talk about it, you know? Uh, but, but if you are typing into the chat, can you type to everyone so that everyone can see, right? Why is it that we are not, we don't want to use the maximum, the coordinates of the maximum minimum point to solve this? Why do we want to introduce this? Can you type into the chat or speak, just speak through your microphone? As uh, Brian types, right, for Jovi and Nigel, you understand why I am not using the coordinates of maximum and minimum point, right? Okay, good, Jovi. Then Nigel, you also understand why I don't want to use the coordinates of the maximum and minimum point for this question. Can I get answer? I can get answer. It's just that I don't want to use this method, the method for this particular question. Hey, Brian, are, are you typing? Or, or are you 
preparing a speech to talk to talk through your the microphone. What? Okay. Um. Okay. Brian says that the question requests for algebraic solution using the coordinates of the maximum and minimum point. Yeah. Cassidy, I think this is a good. You understand, right, Cassidy? Okay, because the intention, the, the reason why we should actually like a question that is like this, it is because this question is very creative. This question is usually set. This question is usually set as a graphing question. But it is asked as a graphing, but anti-graphing, you know, like, please don't use graph, solve this algebraically. Okay, let, let's make sure that we know this for now because I do believe that they will continue to ask something that is like this. We should be looking forward to variations. Actually, um, our schools has less variation as compared to Cambridge. It's just that Cambridge, every year, they will limit their, the variation in terms of the kind of question that is produced. So most likely about maybe 5 to 10% are going to be questions that you have never seen before from Cambridge. Our schools also do that, like, okay? It's just that when they appear, right, no one cares because everybody die anyway. <laughs> you know, when, when schools do that, that variation, right, I, uh, you know, the core also die. So you, you tend to focus a lot on those that you that most people can do but you didn't do, get, get to score instead of those that you cannot do and everybody also cannot do. But when it comes to, when it comes to Cambridge exam, it's different. In comes, when it comes to Cambridge exam, right, you really, really want to make sure that you can do everything. That is why that 10 percent where Cambridge vary will become very prominent and having the attitude and having and developing the mindset to understand the process the strategy that is behind the algebra is actually very very crucial so let's know let's let's make sure that we know this time the word algebra here is very specific also. It may not be applied similarly in other questions, but when it comes to this particular question, the word algebraic here just simply says, can you think of a method and can you think of a strategy such that you can be independent of the graph? Because, like what I was saying, my method, I mean, the method that we have come up with here, right? I don't have to see the graph at all. I don't need to know whether there is a maximum or minimum point. And, and just to repeat something that I think I talked about um, in, in November, I always remember this question that I saw in ACJC 2016 in their prelim. It was in their prelim paper two, I think it was question number one, where my student, he used differentiation. I was a bit, a bit sad, okay, that he used differentiation. He should have used something that was like this. So, and he know his fault. He know he shouldn't be using differentiation. But he was very curious. And he asked me, right, why was it that he used differentiation for a question that was like this, but he didn't get the answer? Okay, he didn't get the answer. And, and you must understand, he, he, he is a very uh, hardworking student and he became pretty good in his H2 math by prelim. He didn't score super, super high, but his math was already, the foundation was already built. So subsequently, he did get his uh, A, and it was a very assured A. But once, you, once your H2 math foundation is built well, right, you know, it, is, it is almost confirmed okay, that you're going to get an A, regardless of whether you fluctuate or not, in the end, you will still get an A. So, so and that's what Cambridge exam tend to do. You know, they, it will bring out the essence of those students who are really very good, not not lucky, lucky, that kind, you know. So, um, so when he asked me, right, I was like, okay, I know he tried differentiation because he probably has been trying differentiation. So he continued to use differentiation despite me shouting all the time that he should be using this was because he used differentiation, he got it correct, and his school or his tutor, right, actually gave him marks. But that day, he used differentiation and he didn't get the answer. So he asked me, like he know is this, and, and he told me I don't have to show him this. But he was asking, why was it that he used differentiation and didn't get the answer? So I was like, mm, actually it cannot be. I told him, you definitely should be able to get the answer. Then I checked his solution. There was no careless mistake. But indeed, he didn't manage to get the answer. So I was also wondering, like, actually why? Uh? And so I was, okay, I was telling him, okay, 
why not we draw the graph? Okay, why not we draw the graph? Because for you to use differentiation, you are, you are actually supposed to draw the graph. Did he draw the graph? He didn't draw the graph. And when we drew the graph, we saw a graph that was something that, like, that was like this. Um, it was like this, where the graph was something that was like this. And uh, I, I, I cannot exactly remember, okay, but I'm going to just anyhow draw one graph. Okay, It was a graph that was something that was like this. Then uh, something that was like this. There was a horizontal asymptote here, here. So when he used differentiation, he let dy dx be equal to zero. He found the y coordinate here. And he didn't manage to find this. That was where the fault came about. Because differentiation can only work when there's a maximum minimum point. Differentiation is actually not going to work algebraically when there is no dy dx is equal to zero. But then you have something that is like this. Okay, so that reminds us again about the beauty of this particular question. This algebra is really, really independent of the graph. Okay, but this question has an has other problem. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about it. So, so before I, I move on to the next question, I know we have already spent a lot of time in this question, especially uh, we have talked about it uh, like a few times before, but um, there's something that I was reminding you last year or so, and this year, if you don't change this, by mid-year, some of you are going to feel the pain. Follow instructions that are given to you by the question closely, and make sure that your presentation, especially if it is a very important kind of presentation, you present it properly also. But for us, since we want to be aggressive in our H2 math, regardless of um, whether it is important or not important kind of presentation, right? Let's just make sure that we follow a good presentation. Because if you were to look at AJC's solution, they left the answer as y to be less than or equal to minus 5, y to be bigger or equal to minus 1. Uh, and you may actually be marked wrong because the question says you must give the set of values that y can take. So please don't follow AJC's solution. If the question asks you for the set of values that y can take presentation-wise, I'm not going to leave it in this form. I'm going to make sure that I write it in the set notation. So I'll write it as something that is like this. y is less than or equal to minus 5 or y is big or equal to minus 1. Okay, I'm, I will make sure that I write it in like this. And this is not just differentiation. Uh, sorry, this is, this is not just presentation. This is important. The set notation that, is, that I'm writing down here gives me the ability to express my solution beyond just an inequality that is like this. You know why? Because now I'm saying that y are real numbers, real numbers that are less than or equal to minus 5, or real numbers that are bigger or equal to minus 1. Because one day, we may be facing a question which, has, which may define for you that y are integer values. May not be real numbers, y are integer values. And you're supposed to find a set of values that y can take. And if you were to write y to be less than or equal to minus 5, or y to be bigger or equal to minus 1, you are not fully expressing the precise solution, the precise answers for y. But by expressing it in the form of a set notation, then you can write it as y belong to integer values such that y is less than or equal to minus 5, or y to be bigger or equal to minus 1. So there is a meaning to set notation, there is a usefulness to set notation. So next time when we see this, even if your teacher, your tutors don't really care about this, and I actually respect those people who don't care that much about simple presentation that is like this, you know, I want you to care. But I don't want you to lo lose any marks. And I don't want you to even put in effort in second semester to watch out for this because if we can just take out of it now. By second semester, it's just natural that when they ask for sets, I'm going to write this. It's just natural that since my secondary school, right, it is just natural that every time when I give my solution, by default, I'm going to go for three significant figures. I don't need to put extra effort. Let's move on to the any question. Any question? Okay, and please make sure that you understand, okay? So, um, 
preferably, although this is a very good set of solution already, but preferably you can do something that is like this, okay, which constantly remind you of the meaning that is behind the algebra. Um, question number two. Question number two is, um, is inequality that we spend one session discussing. I mean, it, it relates us back to the inequality that we spend one session discussing in November or October. Remember, we, we, we were playing that that game, not game, okay, but we were doing that worksheet where it was like mistakes after mistakes after mistakes and we were trying to spot mistakes. Why? Because inequality, I was telling you that if you want to study well for inequality, make sure that you study two things. Number one is inequality itself. We're solving an inequality as if it is an inequality question. Number two is knowing that H2 math is making use of inequality to make another point. This is the one that is harder. This is the one that your school is focusing on, but a lot of us just see it as inequality. But it is not just inequality. It is making use of inequality to help us, to equip us with the skill to do logical analysis. To do logical analysis. And if you think about it, this logical analysis is not going to be contained within just math. If you can grow, if you can develop the strength to do good and and organize analysis using logic. You can actually apply it to a lot of different places. Even law, you know, I was, I was, I just remember, remembered uh, when I was in a university. We, it is compulsory, like, okay, for us to to take. I mean, although I was in mechanical engineering, but it was compulsory for us to take law. Because engineering law is also, uh, it's also crucial. You know, when you are when you are doing some engineering stuff, then you may encounter some legal stuff. So, so engineering, so law, right? Not engineering law, but law by itself. A general law module was compulsory for us. Then, um, <clears throat> then the, the lecturer was like super good. You know, like he's really very, very good. You know, he's very vocal. Uh, he, was, he, will, he looked very fierce, but um, somehow, okay, people love him. So his lecture, right, was actually even more popular than the engineering lectures. And I remember there was once when he had some legal stuff, because he's not a lecturer, he's an actual practicing lawyer who his friend asked him to come and took up a module in the university. So during, the, uh, du during one week, he told us that he has some work. And he was, a big, he was using the biggest lecture hall because every engineer would attend just one single law. So, so he was saying that, um, okay, I, I couldn't make it this week. You know, can, I, can we shift? Okay, and he was trying to find another time to use that big lecture hall because such big lecture halls cannot, it's not like very readily available. Everyone want that big lecture hall. So uh, they gave him Saturday morning. <laughs> you know, the worst possible time, 8 a.m. I was like, wow, goodness, you know. Like 8 a.m., are there going to be people attending? Then when I was there, right, wow, I was so shocked because uh, it, it overflowed. I don't even know how come it will overflow, but people were actually sitting on the staircase, you know, listening to him talking about law. Then I remember that morning, right, he actually told us that, you know, guys, you guys engineers, right, you should become lawyers. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, you should become lawyers. Because, right, in case he told us, in case you guys don't know, if you are an engineer, you will command this amount of salary. If you become lawyer, when you have a background in engineering, because of your ability to do this analytical thing, right, your salary as a lawyer is going to be not... 20, 10 percent, not 10 to 20 percent more than your engineering, you know. It is going to be immediately 100 percent more. You will double your salary. So by the end of that lecture, uh, because he was very casual that day, you know, so by the end of the lecture, right, he was saying, okay, seeing so many of you here, right, um, in case you guys, any of you are interested in doing law after your engineering, taking up two degrees, here is my name card. Then he put his name card there. Then, wow, you know, I saw so many of my friends rush down to just grab his name card, talk to him and stuff. So, so okay, digress a bit too much. So let's, let's continue, okay, with our inequality. So if you were to look at this question, we know exactly what the first part is trying to focus on. Without using the graphing calculator, solve this inequality. Without using the graphing calculator, solve this inequality. And we must know that this is an inequality question, but the focus is on algebraic analysis. 
Okay, this is the kind of question that we are looking at in the first part. So if you are to look at the solution, we don't have to do this. Let's just look at the solution. If you are to look at the solution, okay, the first thing that they did was exactly what we have discussed. And in case last year you didn't catch it this time round, please make sure that at least you are convinced that there's something that is happening in the background. We are, we are, I'm going to be talking a lot today. Like, because we are going from one question to another question, we are not focusing on just one single topic. My aim is to get us warm up again to H2 math. So, in case you really find that, hey, you know, some of the things that he say, right, I say like me, uh, I've, I, I, I didn't manage to catch it. Wait, don't frantically copy down or whatever. I'm, anyway, I'm going to, I mean, this year, right, I'm going to be sharing the videos. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm recording everything and I'll be sharing it this time, you know, for, with you guys, right? So, every time, after our session, I will try to share the videos and the videos should be up on the tuition material that page. Okay, on the tuition material page for two weeks, then you can at least go and refer to it again. Okay, but the thing is, um, if we can finish everything by end of April, we will have May, June, July to revisit all the pure math. And I can guarantee you, okay, May, June, July, when we can revisit the pure math, we are going to go deep. We are going to go deep and we are going to build a foundation that is so strong that I believe it is going to help us to overcome almost all questions by the time we reach our A-level. I am pretty confident that we can do that. So for today, right, you just want to discuss with me, identify certain weakness that maybe you have missed out in, the, in your J1. If you can copy down, if you can take note, that will be the best. If not, we, are, we have prepared. You know, we can still wait for May, June, July period. So if you were to look at this, you know, it is in accordance to the strategy that we have discussed. The first thing, they move one over to the left-hand side. Make sure that the other side is equal to zero. And for whatever that is on the left-hand side, we are going to be doing our algebraic analysis. And to aid our algebraic analysis, we should try to make the left-hand side as simple as possible. So according to what they have done, they try to factorize it into multiples. And successfully, they managed to factorize it into multiples of linear expressions, which they got to here. The denominator is somewhat algebraically may be a little bit um, intimidating to some people. It is not difficult, it's just a little bit intimidating because you cannot get nice numbers. So we can use um, quadratic formula to factorize the denominator or this is my preference, like what AGC had done, it is to use completing square. So we have factorized everything into linear expressions, we have gotten this. And I think for those of you here, uh, Nigel is probably the only school who is drawing this W curve. I, Brian, I'm not sure whether your school is still drawing the W curve, but for, for most schools, right, they should be doing the plus minus plus minus, correct? So if I were to do the plus minus plus minus, it is the same as this curve. We will have a minus 2, we will have a 2 minus square root of 3, we have a 1, we have a 2 plus square root of 3. Then if you were to sum in numbers into the entire expression, into this entire expression here, if I were to sum a number that is bigger than, you should get a positive, then you should get a negative. If you, were to, if you were to sum a number that is in between, positive, negative, positive. We are looking for the region where this entire expression is less than zero. So we are looking at the negative regions. It is going to be this and this. So x is going to be between here and between here. We will be coming back to this. And, and you, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to repeat and revise very quickly in a short while, okay? This algebraic analysis thing. Okay, we have talked about it a lot of times. I don't want to bore you also, but I still feel that you know, at least for today, right, we should just go through it one more time. Um, during our revision in the media, we will still go through this again, okay? But I want you to do something for me first before we talk about the algebraic analysis. I want you to see how AJC do the second part. So can I just give you maybe uh, one minute can you try to digest what AJC is doing in the second part first? Then we continue with our discussion. Can you try? Look at the second part.
Well, Brian, I'm, I'm looking at your explanation again, right? So, so precise. Very good, eh, Brian. Okay, I assume that you have sort of like get the second part already. So, can you see the problem with the second part of the solution? Somehow, I must admit that letting you see the second part of this AJC solution is, uh, is not exactly trying to build us up in terms of doing this question. If you were to ask me the second part of this, is not a good solution. It's really not a good solution. It is not a good solution, not because it didn't manage to get us the answer. In fact, it, it is getting us the correct answer. But you know what is the problem with the second part? You look at it again. The second part is not exam friendly. The second part is not exam friendly. That means, right, if you would have done something that is like what AJC had done, you may gain success in your revision package. You have time to do your analysis. You have time to slowly get to the answers. And you have an answer key to reference to, so you can slowly go back and do all the refinement. But in the exam itself, if you are going to produce this set of solution, the consistency is not there. You're going to be rushing some more. What is the problem with the second part? Because in the second part of this, this question, AJC decided to use an algebraic process. They tried to do an algebraic analysis. They should not have done that. And I don't want you to do this unnecessary also. You must understand that algebraic analysis, in case you have forgotten, is actually tough, it's difficult. Algebraic analysis is difficult because you are analyzing a lot of numbers at the same time when it is done in inequalities. When it is done for equations, it is actually easy. Because when it is done for equations, you are usually focusing on specific values of x, one or two x that satisfy the equation. But when you are dealing with inequality, you are looking at values that are between here and here, between here and here, which are a lot, a lot of values. And that is why inequality becomes the perfect tool to train students to do algebraic analysis because it is challenging. And because it is challenging, if they pose this challenge to you, if you can overcome it, your algebraic analysis become better. But it is challenging. It is way more challenging. Like for example, in the first, coming back to the first part, we know, we must know why. That what I was telling you, if you are just blindly following the algebra, which you have already done in your secondary school, which is what you are familiar with in your secondary school, you are not making any breakthroughs. You must start to expose yourself to areas of H2 math that you are not familiar with, identify them, and your aim is to overcome it and become familiar with it. So for the second part of, for the, sorry, for the first part, you know, they did all the manipulation to derive at this x minus one, then x plus 2 divided by x minus 2 minus square root of 3, then x minus 2 plus square root of 3, this is less than 0. They derive at this. Let's, let's revisit. Why do they want to derive at something that is like this? The moment when they derive at something that is like this, it becomes possible for us to do algebraic analysis. Before this, right, when it was a numerator divided by a denominator, it was actually also possible. Because you can do analysis that is like this, because of your familiarity with multiplication and division. I know that if this times this divided by this times this is going to be less than zero, it can be positive, positive, for example, divided by negative, then positive. If this is positive, positive, negative, positive, then when I put all this together, it is going to be less than zero. So this is one variation. Another variation, maybe it is going to be like minus, minus, sorry, minus, minus, then plus, then minus. If I were to put all this together, it is also going to be less than zero. Which means that for a case that is like this, because of our ability, because I know this can be, I can make use of arithmetic to do my algebraic analysis. That is why I know that, you know, by doing so, I can actually work out the possible x that satisfy this whole thing. 
the possible x that satisfy this whole thing will be when x is such that this expression is bigger than zero. So if I were to extract out this expression, I know I, for this case, right, this must be bigger than zero, which means that x must be bigger than one. I extract out this expression, I know that x minus two minus square root of three is going to be less than zero. So x is supposed to be less than two plus square root of three, and I can continue to work on the other two set of, sets of values of x. But at the same, so, so this is our algebraic analysis where we try to manipulate my algebra so that I can set it up to a condition where this kind of analysis was possible. Before this was done, that means when it is of a form that is like this. When it is a form that is like this, is it possible? It is still possible because for this to be less than zero, it will be the numerator less than zero, denominator bigger than zero or the numerator bigger than zero, denominator less than zero. Then you solve for the corresponding values of x. It is also an algebraic analysis. But your school identified that this kind of algebraic analysis, especially when it goes to more and more terms being planted together, will become very tedious. You'll become so tedious that I've not even finished writing down all the possible cases. You will become so tedious that you are going to be spending more time listing down all the possible cases of the combination of all the positive, positive and negative signs together than to actually do the algebraic analysis. So they invented, not invented, so they utilized a very, very good presentation. You know, that was when last year I was telling you the presentation that you have learned since your um, primary school all the way until today, some of them is actually life-changing. You know, some of them, sorry, some of them are life-changing, are really, really seriously life-changing because they help you to organize the way that you think in a way that is so efficient. We're going to see that in the first, uh, in the first topic of uh, statistics, a superb topic. It is about thinking. The solution is very, very short. It is, it is this topic which I think some of you might have uh, learned in your secondary school or get exposed to it before. It is this topic called permutation and combination. The solution is damn short. Usually it's just one line but it can be four marks. And the four marks are going to be awarded for you thinking. It's a very, very amazing topic. So anyway, um, what your school has devised for you, right, to be able to think of this fast is to just simply make use of uh, presentation. By organizing everything, instead of just listing it, like, like listing it down in a disorganized manner, by listing it down in a grid, it will actually make all this plus, minus, plus, minus faster to churn out. So what we, are, what we were supposed to do was um, to look at this expression. So x minus 1, we are supposed to look at x plus 2. We are supposed to look at x minus 2 minus square root of 3. We are supposed to look at x minus 2 plus square root of 3. And we want to know when are the terms positive or negative. So if I were to draw for myself a number line, I know that for this, 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 this to be positive or negative, for example, this, the, <coughs> it is to be do to be um, I mean this is going to be related to one. Anything when x is bigger than one, then this is positive. When it is equal to one, it is zero. When it is less than one, it is negative. So it is related to one. So if I were to list down all the numbers that cause the individual expressions to be positive or negative, then I will have a minus two for this. I will have a two minus square root of three for this. We will have a one for this and we will have a 2 plus square root of 3 for this. And what you, are, what you were supposed to do is to, like what I was telling you, if I were to just draw some reference line here, okay, let's say if I have some reference line here, um, for this to be positive or negative, it depends on 1. When, it is bigger, when x is bigger than 1, it is positive. When x is less than, it is negative. Similarly for this, it depends on minus 2. When it is bigger than, it is positive. When it is less than, it is negative. For this, it depends on this. When it is bigger than, it is positive. When it is less than, it is negative. For this, it depends on this. So when it is bigger than, it is positive. When it is less than, it is negative. Then when I, I mean, this makes it, makes this process super, super fast. And when I sum all, that, all of them together, it will be this times this divided by this divided by this. It is going to be a positive number. This is going to be a negative number. This is going to be a positive number, negative number, positive number. And all this plus and minus, plus and minus represents the combination x minus 1, then x plus 2, divided by x minus 2 minus square root of 3, then x minus 2 plus square root of 3. So now I can see again, you know, what are the values of x that will cause this entire thing to be 
less than zero. So I know it is going to be this region. I know it's going to be this region. I'm going to derive at the exact thing. And the thing is, this is very, very efficient. That is, what, that is why we should love it. That is why we should make use of the full advantage of this structure. And that is also why after your school has introduced to you this structure, you should, in the exam, jump from here directly to here, this part. But in the exam, you should jump directly from here to here because it is fast and it works all the time. It works all the time. Because this part is actually very unnecessary. Because ultimately, right, you just need to pick a number that sub into all the expression to get the number, which is also the same as subbing it directly into here. But what you need is actually the numbers that you are supposed to sub in. So all these linear expressions gives you the number. You know, it cut up the x-axis into, uh, it cut up the, the number line, right, into different sections for you to know what numbers to sub in. Okay, so in the exam, go from here to here. But when you study, once in a while, this part is very taxing. Okay, to me, like repeating this, right, I'm also like a bit doubtful, like, okay, whether this is still going to be interesting to you, although I plan to repeat this again in, in our revision after, our, after we finish our study six. But I do think that once in a while, right, we should try to do this to remind us and at the same time to strengthen our ability to do algebraic analysis and to also recognize that to be able to do algebraic analysis, it requires extra effort. The moment when it is not requiring extra effort, like for example this, which will allow us to skip all this, it is when a question is very specifically designed so that this can happen. And that was why I was telling you, unless it was designed for an algebraic method, or else if you want to solve it as an inequality question, you should decide not to use an algebraic method. It's not because you don't know how to use algebraic method. It's because precisely you know that's why you want, you want to also know when not to use it. For example, part two of this question. You must recognize when not to use algebraic method. You look at part two. Like what I was telling you, the problem with part two is they are trying to use algebraic analysis. And the reason why their solution has to discuss about this, discuss about that, discuss about, you know why? Because they are trying to discuss all the possible values of x, which are a lot. And they're trying to contain all the different x that are here and there, here. It is not an equation they are looking at, you know. It is an inequality, so it is a, it is a range of values of x. So they must discuss this, they must discuss that, they must do this, do that, do this, do that. And that is why their solution become not good enough for the exam. And you don't do this. For all inequality question, when they have something that is like this, I've never once seen that you're supposed to continue to use algebraic method. You're supposed to choose your own method. Because no matter what, this is still an inequality question. That is why you should know what is the best way to solve a problem. And the best way to solve the second part, let's try. Let's try now, okay? And let's make sure that we are convinced that we are convinced that we are supposed to know the correct tool to use for the correct situation and not blindly just apply. Sadly, I feel that this solution here has blindly applied an algebraic method. So let's redo. Let's redo again the second part and let's see what is the difference that we are going to be experiencing. Okay. And uh, I didn't interview you guys, okay, but I'm assuming that you can see, right, the second part is uh, it's not exactly very friendly. It's not, it's not like cannot be understood, but it's not friendly. If you have time to read it, if you have time to find ways to analyze everything, every, every possible values of x, I think this solution is actually pretty good. But if I don't have time, and if I already know how to analyze, I don't need to train myself again unnecessarily, especially under exam situation. So from the first part, I know that my answer, oh, let me use red. I know that from the first part, my answer is minus two. X is going to be between this and two minus square root of three, or X is going to be between one and two plus square root of three. 
And in the second part, we can see that x that is in the first part is going to be replaced by negative square root of x. I think this is obvious, so I'm going to skip that and that observation. So I know that in the second part, the solution is when I replace the first part solutions x by negative square root of x. So I will have this, then 2 minus square root of 3, or mm, minus square root of x is going to be between 1 and 2 plus square root of 3. Then now I'm, I'm going to decide, should I solve this using an algebraic method? If it, is, if it looks easy enough, if it looks sure enough that you can get a solution, then go ahead and use an algebraic method. But if you're unsure, please solve it as an inequality. And how do we solve inequality? If it is linear inequality, I'll probably do some algebra, you know, shifting things here and there, making x the subject. If it is linear inequality, if it is not linear inequality, I will probably consider drawing graph. Why will graph work? Because graph is the perfect solution to a set of, to a continuous set of values. And x-axis is a continuous set of values that you're analyzing. The y-axis is the continuous set of output that you're trying to analyze. It is the interaction between two number lines. And number lines are meant for us to see at a glance a full set of values. So let's use graph. I'm going to sketch the graph of I'm going to sketch the graph of um, y is equal to negative square root of x. And that graph looks like this. Okay, the graph of y is equal to negative square root of x. You can even use your graphing calculator, uh, but I have to add in this solid dot myself. I'll just ask myself, you know, can x be equal to zero? Yes, it can. It's not going to cause anything to be undefined. So if the question didn't say anything, I'll just let this be a solid dot. It will just continue and continue and continue. Then let's draw four horizontal lines. The first one is I'm going to draw this. y is equal to minus 2. y is equal to minus 2 is here. y is equal to minus 2. Next, I'm going to draw this. 2 minus square root of 3. It is a positive number. So 2 minus square root of 3 is here. So this is y is equal to 2 minus square root of 3. Then 1, 1 is here. 1 is bigger than 2 minus square root of 3. So this is the line y is equal to 1. And the last one is this line y is equal to 2 plus square root of 3. Okay, I have these four horizontal lines. And I'm looking out for this, which is now on my graph represented as the y coordinate. So I'm looking out for the values of x such that the y coordinates of this graph is between here and here or here and here. Where is this happening? This is only happening here, right? This is only happening here. Easy. You know, it's not happening anywhere, only here. This is the range of values of x such that y is going to be between this or y is going to be between this, only here. And can I find this? Yes, I can. Let's Let's be very specific and precise since we are not pressurized to do this paper. Here, in order for me to find this value, I switch my strategy. Instead of working with a continuous range of numbers, I'm interested in one specific number and I switch to equation. And for equation, I really don't mind solving it algebraically. So for the x coordinate of this point, I'm going to let um, I'm going to let this minus square root of x be equal to minus 2. Squaring both sides, I know x is equal to 4. So I know this is 4, this is at 0 immediately because I've used the right 2. Immediately because I've used the right 2, I know that my answer is x is bigger or equal to 0 and strictly less than 4. I even managed to include the 0 because I drew my graph properly and I know that this is the value of x that will cause y to be between this and this. I don't need to do like what the solution did, which will still require them to find ways to analyze zero or non-zero, whether there's solution, no solution. My graph settles everything because I choose the most powerful tool to solve a non-linear inequality. And what some people do when they are trying out algebraic method, the worst kind of strategy, right, is to want to try out algebraic method or rather they didn't see that graph is a better strategy and they thought that they must all do everything algebraic, but yet they don't understand algebraic. 
they don't understand algebra and they think that, hey, this is just like working on equation. You just need to square both sides and everything like equation. So what you know what some people will do? Some people will just, oh, okay, okay, okay. This, right? This, this, okay? I'm, I know that x is going to be replaced by minus square root of x, okay? And I have this, right? What is the values of x that is going to satisfy? I'm going to just square both sides. So if you were to square both sides, nice. This will become just x. If I were to square both sides, okay, minus 2 square, this is going to become 4. Then this square, this square, actually I've already done that. This square is going to be 0 0.071797. I mean, obviously, it is wrong, right? You're getting a number that is bigger than 4, 4, and less than 0 0.07 something. They got it wrong. And, and you know why they have gotten it wrong? It's not because the understanding is too difficult. It is because they didn't spend time to go and sort out. You know, what is, under what situation, I will use what, under what situation, I will use what, and they didn't manage to sort out the importance of logical analysis and just think that algebraic, using the algebraic method is just doing algebra. So they just apply algebra. Then this will happen. Then you're going to lose. Uh, here, how many marks are you going to be losing? Wow. You're going to be losing four marks, maybe. Maybe even three marks. Maybe, sorry, maybe just three marks. I'm not sure, okay, but possibly you are going to be losing all four marks. In fact, uh, in, Ju in, uh, in, in November, when we were talking about, when we were talking about uh, algebraic analysis, I was also showing you a question, and I remember asking you guys to do it after we have done all the wrong, 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 you know, that, that, that worksheet. It was actually a question that is from this AJC. If you were to look at the, I mean, if you were to look at the question on the last page, question number 11, I think, this question, but I don't know whether you guys can recall, but we actually did this question. And I was telling you that this question, it was the last question in their promo. So I will feel like, okay, a lot of people will not be able to get to this. So not many people will, will, will get a chance to look at this question and probably they would have already burnt their promo paper. But this is a spectacular question. This is a very, very good question because this question attempt to bring out, AJC understand this, this question attempt to bring out the essence of how logical analysis is embedded into inequality. They can't embed this into equation, but they can do it for inequality because when they do this in equation, it is not challenging. Even if it is challenging, you would have been challenged since your secondary school. So inequality. They brought in this challenge. Let me very quickly revisit this question number 11 with you to show you once again and for us to recall once again you know, the power, that, <clears throat> the, the strength that we get if we were to study inequality properly. Because this question number 11, this question number 11, you will realize one thing. Okay, okay, you will not realize this yet, but by the second semester, you will start to see how closely something that is like this a question that is like this is simulating those few, not a lot, those few questions that will appear in your A-level. I was telling you, there will be that 10, 20% where A-level really tests. You don't need to be a superb math student because they don't expect anyone, everyone who take H2 math, right, will be someone who are going to be specialized in math. But they'll expect that if you are studying H2 math, if you put in your heart to study H2 math, you study it because it helps you to grow, regardless of whether you're going to be taking math or not next time. So this is one such question. You will see something that is like this in the A-level. Even this year, when even last year, 2020, when A-level was a little bit easier than usual, you still, you still see this question. There was actually one question that is almost entirely like this. One full question. So for this question, let us very quickly go through. We have done it before. Even if you have forgotten, it is fine. We can just look at this question very quickly. Um, and by the way, if you have a question, just ask me, okay? Because I have not asked you a question for a while. I have not really discussed with you that much uh, so far. But, but coming back to this, right? For this question, question number 11, um, part one, we are supposed to sketch that graph. It's a really sketch. You know, uh, okay, you look at your... Okay, I'm, I'm going to flash this here, okay? So... <clears throat> 
So it is already sketched in the solution. So in the solution, you have this. Okay, sketch the graph of y is equal to modulus of this minus b. And this graph is intersecting the x-axis at two points. One is where it is a minus x, the other one is at a plus, sorry, a minus b, the other one is at a plus b. Then after that, you are supposed to sketch another graph, a, a transform graph. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the graphical transformation, so I'm going to just quote the transform version. The transform version is x minus a squared divided by a squared plus y plus b squared divided by b squared. This is equal to 1. I don't know whether you, you can still remember, but this is an ellipse. And since the question tells us that b is a number that is smaller than a, so for this ellipse, it is going to be of a shape that is like this. It is the flatter kind of ellipse. So we have something that is like this, where this is the center of the ellipse, which happened to fall at the lowest possible point of the tick. This is a minus b. Um, this height is b. So if this is minus b, this is going to be just touching the x-axis. So this point here is going to be from here to here is A. So this will be at the y-axis. So let me draw in the y-axis. So this is going to be at the origin. And, uh, and the x-coordinate of this will be A plus A. So it will be 2A and minus B. Okay, so we have this. Uh, this is still okay. It is still easy. It is the last part where they try to look for students who doesn't need to be super, super good in math, but study the algebraic analysis part of inequality. But the very last part, they, they now look at this. Modulus of x minus a minus b, then minus b plus b over a, square root of a square minus x minus a square. This is supposed to be less than zero. You don't even need to solve this because the solution has already been given. They say that the solution to this is, uh, oh, they use a set notation. X is real numbers such that X is bigger or equal to zero and strictly less than one, or X is supposed to be strictly bigger than five and less than or equal to 2A. Yeah, okay, so, <clears throat> so it is this. Well, this is the solution. Your aim is to actually solve for A and B. Uh, you know why this is a very, very, very well-planned question? Because this is, this is like a graph question, which means that the inequality can be solved using the graph. But in order for you to solve it using the graph, you need to at least do a bit of analysis, logic analysis. And they purposely give you something times something is less than zero. They didn't give you three things multiplied together, four things multiplied together. They purposely give you just one, two, two things multiplied together, which means that the number of combination where two things are multiplied together to be less than zero is lesser. It is more manageable. They are fair. They are fair in setting this question. So I know that if this times this is less than zero, it must be either one positive, one negative, or one negative, one positive. It must be either of these two cases, correct? And this is related to this equation. So the y coordinate here represent this entire thing. As for this, it is making use of this equation by making y the subject. Let me write it down. By making y the subject for this particular equation, y is going to be equal to minus b plus or minus b over a square root of a square minus x minus a square. Okay, y is going to be equal to this. But we are focusing not on minus b plus or minus. We are focusing on minus b plus. Minus b is here. The y coordinate is minus b. So minus b plus means that it must be, means that the y coordinate, if this is represented by the y coordinate of this ellipse, it must be the part that is above minus b, correct? So we are looking at this portion here that is above the, <coughs> that is above. So we are looking at this portion here, this, all the way until here. We are looking at the part that is above minus B. So now we want this to be happening. 
can we, I mean, let's focus on this. Okay, when this is plus, this is minus. When will it happen? I look at my graph. Okay, the y coordinate is plus here. The y coordinate is minus here. It happens about a minus b. Correct? It happens about here. With the top of the modulus graph, the top here is plus, the y coordinate is plus, and the bottom here is minus. If I were to just base on my graph, what is the solution? It is going to be bigger or equal to zero. I know it has to be equal to zero because when it is equal to zero, this is minus. This is plus. So I'll include zero. But will I include um <clears throat> will I include a minus b? Because the other number here is going to be a minus b. Will I include a minus b? This is x is equal to a minus b. I will not include a minus b. Why won't I include a minus b? Because when x is a minus b for this modulus graph, this is zero. So zero times minus is zero. It is not, it is not negative, it is not going to be sorry. Hey, sorry, sorry. I, I see I, I'm working on the wrong part. I'm working on this part. Sorry. I'm working on this one. So, so to get a to get a hey, 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 hey. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was working on the right part. Sorry, I see wrongly again. So I was working on this. So to get a plus, I cannot have a zero. So to get a plus, it must be strictly, strictly less than a minus b. Okay? Strictly less than a minus b. Similarly, I have another part. This is the part where it is a plus. It cannot be even equal to zero. So x must be strictly bigger than a plus b. We are looking at this x is equal to a plus b. It must be less than or equal to 2a. Because when it is 2a, this is minus, this is plus, so it's satisfied. So it is this. How about this? Do I need to analyze that? The good thing is no, we don't have to. Why? Because uh, it is not possible for this combination to happen. Why will it not happen? Because for this expression here, this expression, will it ever be plus? It will never be plus. This expression here will be not always negative. It is less than or equal to zero because the y coordinate is always less than zero. Here is equal to zero. Then after that, it is less than zero. It is less than or equal to zero. You know, looking at small little details that are, that are like this, it's going to be very boring for a student who didn't know that they are trying to do an algebraic analysis. But it can be interesting. I, I'm hoping that you guys are not falling asleep, you know, looking at me, trying to analyze all these small, small little values. I hope that you are seeing, you are, you are feeling that little bit of satisfaction, right? That you can actually see that, hey, this, is, this must be, uh, this cannot be negative. You, you can see this. That means you know that you are truly starting to analyze. And you know why? If you are truly starting to analyze small little values that are like this, you actually feel that it is uh, not boring. I'm not sure whether you will feel that it is interesting, okay? But at least you, you, you will probably feel that it's not boring. It's because it is challenging. If it is not challenging, of course you'll be bored. Because it is challenging to analyze all values and you manage to spot those that occur. You, know, you, you use your effort to spot those things that happen, happen, happen. Yeah, that is what that makes it less boring. So we are seeing that happening. Okay, now if I were to compare this to this, then I know A minus B is equal to 1. And I know that A plus B is equal to 5. I form two other equations. And I just solve them as simultaneous equation for A and B. We have a superb question that was set by, by <coughs> AJC. Question number 11. Let's go back to, oh no, question number 2. Was it question number two? Yeah, sadly, we were still at question number two. I'm going to move on, okay? Let me very quickly move on to question number three. And um, I don't think I can finish the paper already, okay? But it is okay. You know, we are going to be using this paper to warm ourselves up. Because we are going to do a serious revision later on in the middle of the year. So, <clears throat> so we are going to warm ourselves up, you know, use, looking at question number three, which is a very good continuation from question number two. Because question number two as an inequality question focused on one single number line. But question number three, focusing on function, improve our ability to analyze by looking at two number lines. 
an x-axis and a y-axis. I was telling you that was the reason why we were studying functions. We don't study functions in our secondary school, not because we, are, we were not exposed to function. It was because in our secondary school's function, many times we are either not required to study a continuous set of values of x that goes into a function. It exists, but it's just that we don't study that. Or we are using one numbers, one or two numbers to put into the function. So we don't actually need number lines. The challenge is way lower. But now the reason why you are studying functions is because you want to learn. It is not just one or two numbers. I mean, in the world, when you build a machine, when you build a process, when will it be just getting one or two numbers? When will it be just getting a few numbers? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. You will usually be expecting a lot of numbers that are between zero and six. A continuous set of numbers. So function is what that's going to build us up for us to seek and find ways to overcome a problem that couldn't be solved as well for what we have learned in our secondary school. So the very first thing that I know is going to help us to grow and become better in function is graph. And when we use a graph to represent a function, we know that the x-axis is going to represent a continuous input, which means that if I were to see something that is like f and h in this question, I'll use a graph to analyze them. Why did I choose a graph? Because the domain of h and f, they are continuous set of numbers. If they are discrete numbers, one number at a time, zero, then jump to one, one, then jump to two, I will probably think about, not think about graph first, I will think about substitution first. So, F, I'll use graph. H, I'll probably also use graph. If you don't know how to use graph, you can forget about scoring well for function. Even if you manage to score, it is probably going to be, it is probably because you have memorized some stuff or you have practiced enough to understand, to, to get the momentum of a particular trend in a question. And this is dangerous for your A-level. You need to do that. You need to know the trend for question. But the A is going to be I mean, you're going to be risking your A because that is not the strength that we are trying to look for. And that's not what the strength of an H2 math student that, the Cambridge, is, that Cambridge is looking for also. So the first thing that I'm going to do is, although it is a one mark question for the first part, I'm going to draw a graph. I know it's going to be useful later on anyway. So I'm going to very quickly draw this graph and I see a problem. You know what's my problem? My problem is I cannot draw FX. I want to be very precise here. I cannot draw fx because for fx, its domain is between k to 3. And I don't know what is k. So I don't know when to chop off the graph. So I've decided, okay, I'm not going to draw fx. I'm going to draw my own function. My own function is represented by this expression itself. And when an expression that represents a function has no domain that is given, we will assume that it takes all possible domain. Not all real numbers, but we will assume that it takes all possible domains because there are certain numbers that may not get into the function and you don't need to explicitly mention about it if, if the function is common enough. For example, ln x. There will not be a lot of times when you're going to see ln x quoted in question and then they explicitly mention to you that x is strictly bigger than zero. You don't need to say this, but you are supposed to know. The ln x is not like x is all real numbers. Ln x is when x is bigger than 0. So I know x cannot be equal to minus 1, x cannot be equal to 3. I'm going to draw it with my vertical asymptote. So I have a minus 1, x is equal to minus 1, and x is equal to 3. Hey, by the way, if you don't understand, right? Because I'm getting a little bit carried away doing my explanation. So if you don't understand, you know, like what Cassidy did just now, right? Please just ask me, okay? I really want to discuss this with you, but I have so much to talk about for this, and I'm trying to suppress it. You know, I'm trying to compress everything to be within the two hours, and I can see that it was already one and a half hours. So, uh, <clears throat> so if you have questions, just stop me, okay? I'll, I'll rather stop and discuss with you than to just you know me going on and on and on. But I will probably ask you some questions in a short while also. So <clears throat> I have this. If I were to plant this into my crop calculator. Um, I will get this. Oh, I've forgotten about quoting something, which is um, I should have quoted the horizontal asymptote. Okay, this graph has a horizontal asymptote because horizontal asymptote is defined as the 
behavior of y when x tends to plus or minus infinity. So when x tends to plus or minus infinity, y tends to zero. And for my GC, it does verify for me that there's a horizontal asymptote x is equal to, uh, sorry, y is equal to zero. And there is a maximum point. This maximum point here, this maximum point here is, uh, this maximum point here is what? This maximum point here is one and minus one quarter. Okay, it is a graph that is, uh, that took us a bit more time to justify the one mark, but like what I was telling you, I, I mean, yeah, unless the question is only asking about this one mark, or else if the question continue to ask a bit more about the graph, I mean, the FX, I will probably still need the graph anyway. So I have this. So what is the smallest possible values of x uh, of k such that f has an inverse? The smallest possible is 1, right? I can see from here. Because k is supposed to be, fx is such that, because fx is such that the domain must be between, uh, the domain of f must be between k and 3, not inclusive of 3. 3 is here, so the smallest possible k can go is 1. So I know that I'm working on this. The smallest k is 1. Okay, let me flash the solution again. So we don't have to write down so much things, okay? So, so, so k is equal to 1. And we are going to make use of, we are going to make use of this value of k to continue with uh, the rest of the parts of this question. So we are looking at fx to be equal to 1 over x plus 1, x minus 3, such that x is supposed to be bigger or equal to k, which I know now is 1, and less, and strictly less than 3. And we want to be very precise. When I'm going to be precise on my graph. I'm going to precise, be precise in my expression. I think this builds the, I mean, this gives us the, uh, the, 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 the advantage, right? in dealing with a lot of other function questions. Because I, I, one, one very prominent, I mean, you guys probably did, didn't read enough script to see this, okay, but I see this very clearly, one very common careless mistake. It seems like careless mistake actually it is. It, it may not be completely because of carelessness. You know, it is when students quote the, quote the domain or the range. You know, they always get the curve bracket, square bracket wrong. Sometimes I also get it wrong on the board, okay, but um, I have to say that usually it is because of habit. You just don't care. You just don't care whether it is precisely bigger than or less than or equal to. You know, so in the exam, when you're rushing, you know, this kind of thing just happen. So anyway, we have this. <clears throat> and um, we are supposed to do what? We are supposed to um, write down the equation of a line where the graph of y is equal to fx is reflected in order for us to get the graph of y is equal to f inverse x. It is the line y is equal to x. It is already quoted in the solution. Sketch the graph of f and f inverse on a single diagram. The solution has already sketched this, but I have, was, I have something to say, which is what I have been reminding you guys. You know, there will be some students who, when they are doing this, right, they will skip sketching the line y is equal to x. And I was telling you why it is important. Even if the question didn't mention, you know, you must still sketch in the line y is equal to x. Common argument is, yeah, first part, they already asked me. I've already quoted the line. Second part, they just say sketch f and f inverse. They didn't ask me to sketch y is equal to x. Why am I penalized for it? It is like the very first question that we discussed just now. It is not about just the solution. It is about the learning point of that particular kind of question. You get the learning point, correct. You focus on the learning point, and you use that learning point to generate a set of solution that will always be correct. If you don't, if you miss the learning point, your solution will sometimes be correct. So <clears throat> this, I want to make sure that I draw in the line y is equal to x. It is okay if you were to draw it as a solid line. It is okay if you were to draw it as a dotted line. Just draw in the line y is equal to x because this is f and f inverse question. And like what we have mentioned before, when it is an f and f inverse question, they are always testing you on the relationship between f and f inverse. They are never trying to test you on an independent f or an independent f inverse. Just by looking at the notation for f inverse, we know this motivation. They could have named it as gx. They could have named it as rx or whatever. But they purposely name it as f inverse x 
so that the relationship to F is always prominent as you stare at F inverse. That is why you need to draw in the line Y is equal to X. Let's spend a bit of time looking at part 4. I mean, it's not like it's difficult. We have discussed this a lot of times. <clears throat> but let's, let's just go through the, the entirety of part 4. Especially the solution is actually very, very little. But the solution is just this. And I doubt, right, that they are looking out for a graph. But this graph is probably an attempt by AJC to... to <clears throat> An attempt by AJC right, to just uh, substantiate their solution. But even if you don't draw the graph, I think uh, they will still give you full marks for it. We have a schematic to analyze composite function. We are looking now at a composite function HF. So our schematic for HF is going to be something that is like this, right? So we have this, this. It will, x will first go into f, then after that goes into h. So the first function is f, the next function is h. For it to exist, we are looking at what that is happening here. So if, if, they were to, if this composite function were to exist, then I want to make sure that everything that comes out from f, they must be able to go entirely into what h can receive. The range of f must be a subset of the domain of... The range of f must be a subset of the domain of h. So we want to analyze this. First, let's try to analyze what is the range of f. For the range of f, I will go back to my graph because my graph is the perfect, is the perfect tool to use to analyze input, output, input, output. It's the perfect tool for me to, at a glance, looking at this, I know that the x coordinate, sorry, I know the x values represent all the possible input because that is consistent for me, for my definition of my graph. This is the graph where the y coordinate represents the output of f. So the y coordinates will represent the output. What are all the possible y coordinates? Looking at this, I know it is going to be from minus infinity all the way until minus one quarter, inclusive of minus one quarter. And how about the domain of h? Domain of h is given to us by the question. The question tells me that the domain of h, where is my question paper? Okay. The domain tells me that um, h is anything that is strictly less than zero. So it is going to be from minus infinity all the way until zero, strictly less than, I can see that this is a subset. So um, I know the composite function hf exists. And I want to remind you for composite function, there's a masterclass in case one day you really have forgotten much about it. You even forget about our session today. You just go and look at the masterclass. The masterclass will explain to you this. Um, <clears throat> next, we want to find what is the range. We have already shown that it exists. We want to find the range of the composite function hf. And we were saying that there are two methods. I'm going to skip the first method. I will jump to the second method directly. The first method is to sketch the graph of... The first method is to sketch the graph of y is equal to hfx. The first method is to sketch this. I'm going to use the second method. For the second method, we will be focusing on h. Well, let's recap the second method, okay? The second method, we will be focusing on h. So, we will be looking at the function h. For the function h, we know what it can receive. That is defined by the domain of h. And the domain of h is from minus infinity all the way until zero. To analyze what can possibly come out from h, we will put everything that h can receive into h, which means that I'm going to put the domain of h into h. I'm going to put this set of values. So I'm going to put a set of value that is from minus infinity to zero into h. And what is going to come out is going to represent the range of h. And to analyze this, I'm going to sketch a graph. Let me just very quickly sketch it here. Um, <clears throat> and the graph of h is going to look something that is like this. So we have this, we have this. For h, it has an oblique asymptote y is equal to x. It has a vertical asymptote, x is equal to 0. And we are looking at the part where x is strictly less than 0. So we have a graph that is like this. Okay. So and a maximum possible point here, this maximum possible point here is minus 1, minus 2. Which means that looking at this, what is all the possible? So this is the graph of y is equal to h, x. So looking at this, what is all the possible y coordinate? All the possible y coordinate is going to be from minus um, infinity all the way until minus 2. Okay, minus infinity all the way until minus 2. This is going to be for h. 
But now situa the situation is changed. H didn't change, but the situation is changed because H is going to be connected to F. And we want to know what comes out from here instead. This is going to be the range of the composite function H, F. So in order for this to happen here, I got to change. The first thing that I go I'm going to change is I'm going to change the input. Rather than from minus infinity to zero, I'm going to change the input such that it is going to be what that comes out from F. What that comes out from F is from minus infinity to minus one quarter. So now this is going to go into H instead of this going into H. And when this goes into H, then what that comes out is also going to be changed. What that comes out is no longer going to be the range of H. What that comes out, since I let this be the set of values that come out from F that goes into H, what that comes out here is going to be the range of the composite function H, F. Okay, right? Anyone is not getting it? Okay, so now what that comes out is going to be this. Looking at this scenario that we have here, I just need to change the input. I'm going to change the input rather than from minus infinity to zero. I'm going to change it from minus infinity all the way until minus one quarter. Minus one quarter is going to be somewhere here. So <clears throat> this point here is going to be at um, minus one quarter, minus one quarter and minus 17 over four. Okay, I will have this and we are looking at from minus infinity to minus one quarter. So we are looking at just this part of the graph. Turning point, come down. Okay, the turning point is still here. So now looking at this part of the graph, what is going to be the range of HF? The range of HF is going to be from minus infinity all the way until minus two inclusive. This is how we're going to find the range of a composite function. Any question? Okay the range of a composite function. Okay, if no question, let us move on. Let us move on to a strange question that we want to discuss. So far, okay, right? Okay, we, we have so far only managed to talk about question number one, question number two, question number three. Question number one is a graph question which is tested as a non-graph question. Question number two was an inequality question which was actually more of our discussion and recap on algebraic analysis, followed by a truly inequality question which we should have done but sadly the solution didn't. Um, then after that, we continue with functions which we see you know, us analyzing functions using graph, picking the right tool helps us to do a proper analysis. But in question number four, question number four, suddenly we are doing integration. And Nigel, I'm hoping that uh, you can sort of still get enough of integration, especially when your school has already started a little bit of it. Um, Cassidy, has your school started integration? Yeah, your school has started a bit of integration, right? Huh? No. Eh? Because yesterday I was talking to another CJC student. Oh, oh okay, okay. Huh. Okay, but you can sort of still remem remember a little bit, lah, right? Because I, I suddenly remember yesterday when I was asking him, he was saying that uh, he can remember a bit because we have done it before. Okay, let's, let's look at what that is happening here, okay? And Jovi, I'm very sure you know integration because you have been asking me some integration then after that differential equation. So this question is also very similar to, to the integration that you do in differential equation. And Brian, I'm just hoping that you will not forget that much of integration. So here, let, let's read the solution, okay? Let's read the solution. So we are supposed to integrate this. And we know that this cannot be integrated directly. So we need to manipulate the expression that is inside. We did a long division. Long division sort of work because this is an improper expression. Where the numerator is x squared, the denominator is x squared. So it is considered as improper. Proper will be when the numerator, where the degree of the numerator is at least one less than the degree of the denominator. So we did a long division, we have gotten this. And uh, one can be integrated, but this still cannot be integrated. And the reason why the question, uh, the solution changed it from here to here was because they were trying to apply fx f prime x. They saw the denominator as fx, which means that fx is equal to x squared minus x plus 1. And f prime x will look like 2x minus 1. 
And sadly, because there was no 2x minus 1 in the numerator, so they minus 1 plus 1 in the numerator to generate a 2x minus 1. And when you integrate this, you get a ln. When you want to integrate this, what they did was they did another round of manipulation doing a completing square to the denominator to simulate the fxf prime x version for us to be getting this tangent inverse. I don't think it is very difficult. For Cassidy, if in case you can't remember, just trust me, okay? If you have done enough practice, right? I don't think this is going to be that tough. Then applying what you have in your MF26, you will get this tangent inverse. But you will see this as square root of 3 over 2 square, which will become this 2 over square root of 3. Assuming that you are still somewhat okay, okay, assuming that you are still somewhat okay, let me move on to B. In B, we are supposed to do a substitution. Integration aside, let's just do the algebraic substitution first. So we are given this as the expression for substitution. So I'm prepared to change all the x, x here and dx here. I will, I'm prepared to change this into a form that, that has u. And since this 0 and 1, this low and upper limit, they are also concerning x. We also want to change them to be you know, related to u. So when x is equal to 0, I sub it into here. I'll be able to get u. u is equal to pi over 2. So 0 becomes pi over 2. 1 becomes pi over 3 x will be replaced by 2 cosine u, which x squared will be 4 cosine squared u. dx, if I can find dx du, dx is going to be replaced by 2 minus 2 sine u du. Simplifying this, we get sine squared. And sine squared is something that you, you should have already known how to integrate since your secondary school. So I'll use double angle integration, uh, double angle identity to change it from u to 2u. And once I change it to 2u, it is a simple integration. I'll be able to integrate, substitute the lower and upper limit in. I'll be able to get answer. For, I mean, for this particular question, okay, which isn't really very difficult, for Brian and, uh, for Brian and Jovi, I assume that you're okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not expecting for Cassidy and Nigel that you'll be totally okay, especially Cassidy, but you still sort of like get what I'm trying to say, right? Cassidy, you still somewhat get what I'm trying to say? Okay, that's great. And um, Nigel, you're also somewhat okay? Okay. Before I move on, because that's, that's, that I think it is about it, you know, for me to discuss this integration with you. Before I move on, sorry, it took me about one and a half hours, but the point that I'm going to make the most important point that I'm going to make for this session is through these four questions that we have just discussed. I, I need to see the way that we are going to be discussing so that we get the most value from the amount of time we are going to spend in H2Math should be like how we have done this question number one, two, three, four. Like what I try to share on Achievers Dot com, you know, on the main site for Achievers, not Achievers TV, but on Achievers.com. If you're going to look at it, <clears throat> I was trying to share that for your H2 math, you must learn how to study topics that are more theory-centric, how to study topics that are more practice-centric. Because you need to channel your energy and channel your effort to study a topic correctly, to get the max out from that topic. The very first question, graph or non-graph, inequality, functions, they are the more theory-centric topics. When a topic is more theory-centric, when you want to learn them as a new topic or when you want to revise them, the best way is actually to spend some time to think about it first, to think about why it happened this way, to think about what that happens behind the algebra before you start doing the question. If that thinking, if that understanding, if that theory that is behind, that is supposed to be powering the solution is not well revised or well learned, you will realize that no matter how much you practice, right, you still not do that well in the exam. Unless, unless you happen to be someone, and I'm not going to assume that everyone is like that. You happen to be someone, right, who as you do, subconsciously you also think of why. But not a lot of us are like that. A lot of us, when you start doing, you will just focus on doing. That means you will unintentionally start to focus on the algebra. 
which is very, very dangerous for a theory-centric topic. Vectors is one that is like this, very, very theory-centric. For a very theory-centric topic, you'll realize one thing. When you look at a solution, when you look at a solution, you get it. Lah. I mean, you get the numbers, but you don't really know what is happening. Vectors, you get, you get the numbers. Of course, you get the numbers. It's so easy calculation. But vectors is so theory-centric that if you were to look at a solution alone, you might as well don't study vectors at all. You will not understand. You will think that you can because the calculation is ridiculously simple, especially if you want to reverse engineer from the answers, you will definitely get part of the solution correct. But when it comes to you doing it independently in the exam, you will probably be almost back to zero because they are theory-centric topics. That was why in order for us to revise and recap using question number one, two, and three, we did a good round of discussion because there are things to talk about behind the algebra. You know, those people who struggle with function, they usually struggle the most in composite function and specifically using the second method to find the range of a composite function. Most people struggle there. And that is where, you, you know why most people struggle here? Because if you to look at this solution, most of the time, the graph is not even provided, like how this AJC did here. You know, they were very generous. They even went, put in some effort to draw the graph, shade the graph properly. But usually the solution is just this. And when a student who just work on function as true practice and without thinking at all, looking at this solution, yeah, it is, seems to be okay. I don't exactly know how the numbers are gotten. I managed to get 50% of the numbers correct, then I'm settled. Then in the exam, that 50% will become 25%. You. Because this is a theory-centric topic. You've got to study what that is happening in the background. But integration is very different. Integration is a very, very practice-centric topic. For a very practice-centric topic like integration, you know, I told you guys before, actually, basically, right, you don't really need to listen to me talk about integration technique. You don't really need to listen to your lecturer talk about the in integration technique. You need to see us do example, not explain, just do, how to do, how to do, how to do. Then you can do and do and do and do and do. I don't know whether any of you had tried that, you know, but I, I, uh, I mean, the last time when I can actually see those people when we were doing integration technique, you know, when, we, when I was doing integration technique with you guys, basically we were just doing over Zoom and stuff. You know, so, so I was suggesting that, hey, don't, don't listen to the lecturer. How about spending the time in the lecture right, to do an experiment for me? Do your tutorial. It works all the time. Just do, 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 you'll get it. The more you do, the better it is going to be. These are practice-centric topic. You look at a solution, the solution immediately explain to you how to do the, how to, how to get. How, I mean, you do more, you look at a solution more, you automatically get it. In primary and secondary school, you'll realize that a lot of topics are more practice-centric. Secondary school, you, you start to get yourself a bit more exposed to theory-centric topic, but it is probably just 5-10%, uh, and they are simple enough. They are simple enough such that for a lot of us, as we do, we automatically will think and we will get it. When it comes to H2 math, things change, and I think that some of you here, right, you may not have adapted to that enough yet. When it comes to H2 math, about 30% or maybe even more are going to be theory-centric. The bulk of it is still going to be practice-centric, so practice is still going to be very important for your H2 math. For example, APGP, for example, um, differentiation, for example, integration technique. You know, all this, the more you practice, the better it is going to become. But for that 30% of theory-centric topic, it is going to be very, very important when it comes to your A-levels because you cannot give up any bit of the marks when it comes to A-level. So this year, that is what we are. We want to aim to do also. I, I need you to synchronize together with me. You know, for certain topics that we need to discuss about the ideas and the theories that are behind, I want to spend that time discussing. And more importantly, I want you to spend the time yourself thinking about the theories that are behind to improve the foundation and to establish what that is necessary, right? For you to assure an A during your A-levels the theory-centric topic. If you don't establish that now, when you go to the university, you will suffer. You know why you will suffer? I mean, I don't know about your siblings, but if you can just listen to some university students talk, 
You will hear them say this. You will hear them say, right? What's the use of me studying all these theories? You know, I, I study all this from the books. In the end, the computer is doing everything for me. You know, I just need to plant in all the numbers into the computer. They will differentiate for me. They will integrate for me. They will plot the graph for me. They will just give me the, uh, the, the result. You know, why, why do I need to even study this? They miss the point. They totally miss the point. Because in our university, now in H2, H2 math at least, okay, about 30% are theory-centric. In a university, if you are doing something that is more factual, uh, humans are not very sure, okay, but if you are doing something that is a bit more factual, 50 to 70% are going to be theory-centric. That means you'll be spending more time thinking than to be doing. Furthermore, the university, you don't even have TYS. There's, not, there's nothing for you to practice for certain modules. And in a university, when you're doing your project, the actual project, the research work, it is almost 100% theory-centric. You know what is more valuable? It is your ability to think and strategize. If you really want to do, do the work, practice and practice and practice, if you want to take over the computer, then you're just going to take over the computer. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to make sure that I am the one who tell and instruct the computer what to do because the computer can't strategize, but I can. I can plan and do this. I can plan let Y be equal to K and then do this. Computer cannot. Computer can do after I've managed to do the planning. So let's make sure, okay, that when it is a theory-centric topic, we study the theory properly, we make sure that we understand all of them properly before I start practice. In the end, you are still going to practice. But when it is a practice-centric topic, we are going to put in all our effort to just practice and practice and practice and practice, just like this question, integration. Let me skip this. Uh, okay, actually, there's something about this that I want to talk about. Um, okay, this is an area and volume question, okay? Because I, I just want to very quickly talk about question number six, but... Uh, okay, Some, something about this question, <clears throat> this, this area and volume, right, that I just want to very quickly highlight to you. Um, integration technique is very practice. I'm oh, sorry, uh, the point that I was trying to make. Okay, the point I'm trying to make. Next week, you're going to start complex numbers. Complex numbers is a more... Okay, so far, okay, for what we have studied in J1, right, uh, graph is... The more theory-centric topics will be graph, functions, inequality, and uh, vectors. Well, these are the more theory-centric topics. For the rest of the topics, summation, APGP, integration, differentiation, Maclaurin's, differential equation. It's not like there's no theories. All are a mixture, okay? It's just whether it is more theory or more practice. Okay, they are, they are definitely going to be a mixture of both. For these few others, I, I repeat again, <coughs> uh, summation, APGP, Differentiation, integration, Maclaurin's, differential equation, they are more practice-centric topic. So they are still going to be the bulk. So we will practice, practice, practice. We have one last pure math topic, which is complex numbers. Complex numbers is very strange because at your level, right, complex numbers is supposed to be a practice-centric topic. The more you do, the better it is going to be. But um, we are going to do it a bit more as a theory kind, you know, in the beginning. And, and the reason is because complex number is very new. Unlike the rest of the topics which you uh, were already exposed to it, so the theory was already sort of like settled in your secondary school if there were to be more any theory-centric things about them. But now, right, complex number, we are going to spend some time on the theory. But ultimately, please make sure that you practice and practice and practice. Then after that, we are going to move on to statistics. And let me tell you, statistics is very, very, very practice-centric. Very, I'm telling you. A lot of people ask, how do you do statistics? Just do. Just do. That is why so many people are going to do so well for statistics because that is going back to their old habitat. <laughs> that is going back to just like your second school. Practice, practice, practice. Do, 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 do. You know, last year, I have a few students who scored 90 plus out of 100 for statistics for paper two, which consists of statistics. It's because it's really very easy. Just do, 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 do. In the end, you don't even need to ask. If you don't know, just do. You know, yeah, of course, you can ask a little bit, ask, get a bit of help, but you don't, you just do. And when we start to do our revision, I will talk about this very briefly again. You know, then you study it properly. Theory-centric, practice-centric. Theory-centric, practice-centric. Get the max out of the time that you spend on revising your H2 math. Um, for area and volume, right, I will say, like, okay, it is really like a bit of half-half. You know, I, I, I personally will see area and volume as a more practice-centric, but for certain people, 
it may be better for them to work on it as a more theory-centric topic. Uh, <clears throat> so for this, right, there's something that is a little bit unique. I didn't manage to talk about it that much the other time when we were doing area and volume, but I think this is a good example. If you were to just look at um, the question on your paper, I'm going to just flash the solution here, okay? For part, for this, this, this question number five, this area and volume question, part two and part three, right? Part two, they ask you to find the area of P. The area of P is this part. Then part three, they ask you to find the volume when this region Q is revolved about the x-axis. Okay, this region Q is revolved about the x-axis. I just want to very quickly highlight to you that if you were to look at the solution, although this region P, although this region P can be obtained by doing an integration with respect to the x-axis, okay, but to be faster, the solution actually integrated with respect to the y-axis. Okay, you, we don't need to go into the detail. I'm not expecting you to immediately be able to understand the whole question. So you just listen to me. So although we can integrate it with respect to the x-axis, but the solution chose, and it is a better way to integrate it with respect to the y-axis. Then for the volume that is generated, it is revolved about the x-axis. The question says so. So we integrate it with respect to the x-axis. This is one small little difference. Okay, not small and... Not exactly small, but this is one difference that a lot of people, they didn't see. And uh, I'm not saying that they didn't see and they get it wrong. Okay? Because you don't see this, you can still get it correct. But I, but I just hope you can see it together with me, which is for area as compared to volume, area has one small little challenge, which is for an area, for a typical area question, they will not tell you the axis to integrate it with respect to. You look at all the area questions, they will just ask you, find the area of the region, find the area of the region, and you are the one to decide whether you want to integrate it with respect to the x-axis or integrate it with respect to the y-axis. It's, it's you who will, who will be deciding. I will, I will show you a question next time where you decide, if you were to decide wrongly, you will, you will generate a solution that is going to be very, very tedious, but you must make the decision. You must consciously make the decision. Because some people just by default always integrate with respect to the x-axis. But for volume, you actually don't need to make this decision, which makes it in a way easier because they will always tell you an axis. For a region to be generated about this axis is different from this same region generated about a vertical axis. You are getting a different volume. So that is the restriction by the question. They cannot just leave it to you to make the decision because you're going to get different answers. Okay, so just take note that for area, uh, in case it has never come across to you before, you actually make one more decision as compared to volume. You decide on the axis to integrate it with respect to. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm actually, I, I just want to very quickly talk about question number six. Uh, I'm not going to do question number six because question number six, if you were to ask me, right, it is actually a more practice-centric topic. The more you practice, the better it is going to be. Is there a theory behind question number six, which is a, uh, which is a maximum minimum question. Yes, there is a theory, but how come we are not talking about the theory? The theory has already been settled in secondary school. Really, it was the, that, that 10, 5 to 10% of theory that I was telling you guys just now, that you actually experience it in secondary school, but you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it because it is still very easy theory. You do a few questions, you will sort of get the theory or so. But when the theory gets more and more complex, you need to do a lot more questions to get a theory. And JC has only two years. You don't have that kind of time. So studying a theory first will become more efficient. So for this, right, I know in H2 math, where was the problem? You know, Jovi, we have talked about it before also. It is not a differentiation problem usually. It is the problem with the first part. The first part, yes, I agree, it is very intimidating, especially uh, if you have some time, you can go and take a look at the first part of this question. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But the first part of this is a more strange case of similar triangle. When it came out in Hua Chong, when it came out in ACJC, uh, when it came out in Hua Chong, when it came out in uh, AJC, and, and it came out in CJC also, 
you know, a lot of people just died in the first part because they couldn't find a similar triangle. I mean, it is there. You just need to spend some time to go and look at it, but it is there. You must understand that this is the kind of challenge. This is the kind of question that cannot be taught. But this is the kind of problem, right, that is in your H2 math that you must experience and find your own way to overcome it in order for you to become better in this kind. The moment when somebody gives you the instruction to do it, you will lessen the chance of you getting it again the next time. So my suggestion to you is when you see this kind of, uh, <clears throat> this kind of question, the, first, the very first part of differentiation, the very first part of differentiation maximum minimum, the very first part of rate of change, when you see this kind, right, you chant to yourself this. You chant to yourself. You chant to yourself, right? When you see this kind, you tell yourself, I love it. You tell yourself, I love this kind of question. I love this kind of question not because it is easier. I love this kind of question because it is my personal challenge. I love this kind of question because it gives me a chance to challenge myself and find my own way to overcome it. Like what I told you guys that time, you know, I think about the prisoner of war. Did, I, I don't know whether, did I tell you in this class? You know, it is those that you're just supposed to be given the problem, the obstacle, and you are supposed to find your own way to overcome it. There's no way people can give you the kind of instruction. So I'm going to leave it to you, okay? And please carry this burden. This burden must be carried by yourself in order for you to build the kind of muscle. It is this kind. There are certain kind of burdens that you know, we can share. For example, let's do one last question, then we stop. For example, right? <clears throat> for example, let's jump all the way to this question, question number 10. Let's jump to question number 10. Uh, let's not look at the solution. Let's just do question number 10, the first part together, which is to sketch the graph of y is equal to f prime x. Okay, it's an easy graph. I know some of you can probably sketch it with your eyes closed. But let me just do it as a recap to get a view one more time. Question number 10, part A. It is the last question that we will discuss today. Next week, we will, we will skip this paper so you can just go and burn this paper if you, if you want. You know, I don't know, it's lame, but <coughs> cold weather. You know, maybe you can burn some paper. <coughs> this, right, let's share the burden together. If we can discuss it now. And our discussion can, can generate for us a set of instruction that we can just use all the time in the exam. You will never fail. Because to draw, to draw the graph of y is equal to 1 over fx is as easy as drawing the graph of y is equal to f prime x. The moment when you just question yourself, what exactly are you drawing? You just question yourself that on this graph that I'm going to be sketching, what are the y coordinates representing? Then you just draw the corresponding y coordinates. That's all. Draw the corresponding y coordinates. Understand, then draw. And the understanding part is ridiculously simple. Let's do a quick sketch based on just understanding, okay? Um, I, I feel that so far we have done pretty well for all the graphical transformation questions. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. So Okay, it is, it is really just a recap, okay? So don't mind me just repeating this one, <coughs> one more time today to end off the, our session. So um, I know the y coordinate that is on this graph is going to represent the gradient that is on that graph. So let's trace through the gradient from the left to the right, all the way to the left. This is the graph of y is equal to fx. And my focus is going to be extracting out the gradient for the corresponding x. So when x is all the way to the left, I look at the graph, all the way to the left, what is the gradient? Zero. Uh, in fact, it is small positive number. Okay, it is not exactly horizontal, it is still tilted a little bit. So it's going to be a small positive y coordinate. So it's going to be maybe somewhere here, because the y coordinate represents the gradient that I see. So the y coordinate is going to be here. Then as we progress, you will become more, more the gradient will become more and more positive. So the y coordinate will become more and more positive. At, until a certain point of time, uh, I can see that the gradient is still remaining positive, but it will start to become less and less positive to zero. So the y coordinate will be less and less positive to zero, and it, and it becomes zero when x is equal to minus three. The y represents the gradient that I see there, so y is zero <clears throat> when x is equal to minus three. 
then after that, the gradient becomes negative and it will just become more and more negative as it goes, as x goes to zero. So the y coordinate will become negative and then more and more negative as it goes to zero. Okay, so far you get it, right? Any question? If you have a question, please just type it into the chat, okay? Then after that, if I were to continue to trace through the gradient, I can see that at this point, the gradient is like super positive, y coordinate is going to be super positive, then the gradient will become less and less positive going back to zero. So the y coordinate will be less and less positive since the y coordinate represents the gradient that I see there. It will go back to zero when x is my when x is two. So two, zero. Then after that, the gradient becomes negative and it will just become more and more negative. So the y coordinate will become negative and then just become more and more negative. And then after that, the gradient is like super, super negative and then slowly become less and less negative. So the y coordinate is like super, super negative and less and become less and less negative until a point where it becomes almost horizontal again, but it's still having that little bit of tilt. So it will, it will go closer and closer to zero, but never actually touching zero. So it will go to zero from the negative side. So we will have uh, something that is like this. Okay, so with this, with this analysis, right, we can already sketch the entirety of the graph of y is equal to f prime x. Okay, but I know, I know, I've missed out some details here. And that is why these few details that I have missed out, uh, which is going to cost me marks, can also be, be, <coughs> be patched if we can give ourselves, if we can plan for it first. Okay, we know by doing this analysis, we can really draw the shape of the graph. But to make sure that I get it entirely correct, I'm going to make use of some, some uh, I mean, the, the instruction that I shared with you. It is something that is not 100% necessary because I personally don't use this set of instruction. But in case some of you, after your promo, you find yourself still struggling a little bit with sketching the graph of y is equal to f prime x, I want you to take a look at the differentiation outline under application of differentiation. On the very first page of the differentiation application outline, you see me sketching the graph of y is equal to f prime x. And I give you these four steps. Again, these four steps are not necessary, but they are good to have so that all the details are going to be fulfilled in your final graph. Let me write down the four steps here. The first one is I'm going to try to ignore the x-axis. The reason why I want to ignore the x-axis, which I find it awkward, you know, every time when I explain about this, I find it very awkward to do that because I don't really know how to explain to you guys who didn't read that much wrong answers. But because I read a lot of wrong answers, I can see how common it is for students to, <clears throat> to really focus on points that are like this. Okay, this is the original FX graph. Then for points that are like this, some students will just go and draw a vertical asymptote from the transformation which is wrong, I mean vertical asymptote, yes, it is for 1 over fx. So just to reduce the possibility of careless mistakes, I'm going to try to ignore the x-axis. The moment when I ignore the x-axis, it just immediately tells me that for the graph of fx, regardless of whether I push it very high up or move it very low, I'm still going to be generating the same graph of y is equal to fx. Because for the same x, the gradient, regardless of the, whether the graph is very high or very low, the gradient remains exactly the same. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is I'm going to try to visually ignore the x-axis. The second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the original graph and looking at all the asymptotes, transforming the asymptotes first. Then the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find easy points to plot on my transform graph. Easy points will be points where f prime x is equal to zero. Easy points will be in general where the gradient is bigger than zero or in general where the gradient is less than zero. And the, fourth, and the fifth one will then be what I have just done here, doing an analysis from the left to the right. Let me just very quickly make use of these few steps to redraw the graph again. And this time, I just want to make sure that, I, <clears throat> that all the details are properly planted in. Um, so I'm going to end off okay, by just redrawing this graph one more time. Okay, first I'm going to visually ignore the x-axis. I'm going to just uh, put a sticky tape on your eye so they can remove the x-axis. Then uh, next, I'm going to work on all the asymptotes. So looking at the original graph. Looking at the original graph, I'm going to work on the asymptotes. Uh, there's a horizontal asymptote, y is equal to 2. And our focus is on the gradient. 
So for y is equal to 2, the gradient's at the 2 end because y equal to 2, this horizontal asymptote is the behavior of y when x tends to plus or minus infinity. At the two ends, the gradient tends to 0. So I know that y is equal to 0 is likely going to be the new horizontal asymptote on the graph of y is equal to f prime x because the gradient tends to 0. There's uh, two vertical asymptotes. One is when x is equal to 0. The other one is when x is equal to 3. Vertical asymptote will remain as vertical asymptote. The reason is because when x is equal to 0 and 3 on my original graph, fx is undefined. That is my definition of vertical asymptote. When x is equal to 0, fx is undefined. So when x is equal to 0, what do you think is the gradient? Undefined. There's nothing for you to find the gradient. That is why x is equal to 0 is going to continue to be the vertical asymptote. That is why x is equal to 3 is going to be the vertical asymptote. Next, I'm going to work on easy points. f prime x is equal to 0. There are two points where f prime x is equal to 0. Just now we have talked about it. Minus 3 and 2. These are the two places where the gradient is 0. So I know that my graph is going to be passing through two points. One is when it is at minus 3. The other one <coughs> is when it is at 2. So I have this. Next, uh, this, this is very, very useful. I do think, um, when I read your script, right, I, I cannot remember who, okay? Uh, someone did it wrongly because I suspect that you didn't draw, you, you didn't go through this step 4. It, it, it looks like very easy when I discuss with you now, but it is the... It is the part that is going to be probably saving you during the exam you know, when you're rushing for time. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just look at my original graph and just in general, right, see where are the positive gradients, where are the negative gradients. I can see that to the left-hand side of minus 3, all these are positive gradients. So I know my graph must reside here. The y coordinates must all be positive when it is less than, when, when I'm looking at a region that is less than minus 3. Then from minus 3 to 0, the gradients are all negative. So from minus 3 to 0, my, grade, my y coordinate must be negative. Then from 0 to 2, from 0 to 2, the gradients are positive. So 0 to 2, my y coordinates are all going to be positive. So my graph is going to reside on top. Then from 2 to 3, the gradients are negative. So my graph resides here. This part, the gradient is also negative. So my graph is going to reside below. I just, I just want to indicate somehow, you know, like my graph resides here, my graph resides here. Then after that, I'll just go from the left to the right. Just like how we have analyzed it just now. All the way to the left, the gradient is a small positive value. So the y coordinate is small positive. Then the gradient will become more and more positive and then less and less positive. So the y coordinate will become more and more positive, less and less positive, back to zero. Then after that, the gradient will just become more and more negative and then continue to become even more negative. So from minus three to zero, the y, the y coordinate will become negative and then just become more and more negative and continue to be negative. It will tend towards this, it will tend towards this vertical asymptote. Then after that, from x is equal to zero to x is equal to two, the curve curve this way, and I'm so tempted to draw this. I'm so tempted. Okay, from x is equal to zero to two, I look at my graph, it looks like this. As I am tempted to draw this, I realize that I have warned myself previously that my graph should be here. Unless I've seen the gradient wrongly, or and unless it's either I was wrong just now, or I must be wrong now. At least it tells me that, hey, just do a quick check. So I, did a, I do a quick check now, I realize that, whoa, okay, the tick was correct. It is all positive gradient. And it starts from a very positive gradient and then slowly goes to zero. So I have this. Then after that, you will become negative gradient and negative all the way. So the y coordinate will become negative and then negative all the way. Then after that, you will be a negative gradient, slowly goes to zero. So you will have a negative y coordinate and you will slowly go to zero. Okay, so this will be my graph of y is equal to f prime x. Any question? We are doing this as a theory-centric. We're okay, not all differentiation are practice-centric. This is theory-centric. One of fx is theory-centric. And it's very, very theory-centric. I mean, how difficult it is to draw the graph. It's not difficult. <laughs> it's very, very easy to draw a graph. So as long as I get the theory, my, my graph is settled all the way until next, uh, all the way, not next year. My graph is settled all the way until the end of the year because I study the theory. And it, you can see people practicing this. Like, they don't want to study, you know, they don't want to sit down and think why the graph is drawn this way. They just want to memorize from their school's notes, this feature become this feature, this feature become this feature. Then just practice, practice, practice. Until the end of the year, they are still making some mistakes here and there. I mean, they will get better and better, but they're spending a lot of time 
to get better when we can just spend 5 minutes, 10 minutes to discuss it properly and it is settled for the next few months. Okay, so let's... <coughs> let's